Thank you for standing by. This is the conference operator. Welcome to the Rogers Communications, Inc. fourth quarter 2022 results conference call. As a reminder, all participants are in listen-only mode and the conference is being recorded. Following the presentation, we'll conduct a question and answer session. To join the question queue, you may press star, then one on your telephone keypad. Should you need assistance during the conference call, you may signal an operator by pressing star and zero. I would now like to turn the conference over to Paul Carpino, Vice President of Investor Relations with Rogers Communications. Please go ahead, Mr. Carpino. Great. Thank you, Ariel, and good morning, everyone, and thank you for joining us. Today, I'm here with our President and Chief Executive Officer, Tony Staffieri, and our Chief Financial Officer, Glenn Brandt. Our call today will include estimates and other forward-looking information from which our actual results could differ. Please review the cautionary language in today's earnings report and in our 2021 annual report regarding the various factors, assumptions, and risks that could cause our actual results to differ. With that, let me turn the call over to Tony to begin. Thank you, Paul, and good morning, everyone. Thank you for joining us on this busy morning. When I stepped into the CEO role one year ago, our performance had been lagging our peers and we had lost our leadership footing. Last year, we set a clear plan to reestablish our leadership position and to deliver sustained, strong results. This included a renewed focus on the fundamentals and a significant improvement in execution. In short, we set a plan to turn around our performance. Twelve short months, I'm pleased to share we have made significant progress. And we did it with the backdrop of a lingering pandemic, a new executive team, and one of the largest proposed mergers in Canadian history. Despite these challenges, we did not get distracted, and we remained focused on driving better execution across our entire business. As a team, we made tremendous strides, but we have much more opportunity in front of us. I have to say I am pleased with the speed and magnitude of our turnaround. Across critical <coughs> valuation metrics such as financial growth and customer share gains, we went from consistently ranking second or third against our competitors over the past few years to now ranking first on the vast majority of these important metrics throughout the year. Our turnaround wasn't about coming out of a pandemic it was about instilling a performance-based culture focused on our customers, returning to growth, and outperforming the market. <clears throat> in 2022, the whole market grew slightly more than prior years, but we grew even more. In wireless, we went from losing market share just a few years ago to now industry-leading share of mobile phone net additions. The momentum you saw in the first three quarters carried through into the fourth quarter and continues to power forward into 2023. Importantly, we met our upgraded guidance for the year and set a strong foundation for growth in 2023. For the full year, we delivered strong total service revenue growth of 6% and adjusted EBITDA growth of 9%, the highest growth in over a decade. And the improvements we delivered in 2022 were reflected in our total shareholder return, which was up 9%. By comparison, our two national competitors had negative returns of minus 4% and minus 8%, and the TSX and Dow Jones were down as well, 5% and 7% respectively. In wireless, postpaid mobile phone net additions were 193,000 in the fourth quarter up 37% from last year. The team executed exceptionally well in Q4, and we delivered the best Black Friday in our company's history. For the full year, we added 634,000 mobile phone net ads, postpaid plus prepaid, our strongest result in 15 years and the best performance in our industry. In cable, we can was flat. <clears throat> we delivered positive adjusted EBITDA despite investments in key areas including customer service. Here we see opportunity to improve our customer share performance and we have confidence 
that our product set, and in particular, internet and TV, have a competitive advantage across our entire footprint, and our recent heightened investments in cable will begin to yield market share growth this year. In media, we delivered a strong fourth quarter and full year. In 2022, we grew revenue by 15% and turned $127 million of losses into $69 million of profit. Our media performance clearly stands out in the industry, reflecting the quality of our assets and the team's execution capability. Importantly, these results did not come at the expense of investment. In 2022, our team invested a record $3.1 billion in capital, the vast majority of which is now in networks. In fact, a doubling of where we were several years ago in network investment. Looking ahead to 2023, we continue to see healthy growth catalysts supporting our businesses from factors such as healthy population growth, penetration headroom, and the benefits our transition to 5G technologies will bring. And against this backdrop of healthy growth, we expect to continue leveraging our execution momentum to drive leading share of customer growth, which will fuel robust organic growth in both total service revenue and adjusted EBITDA, as you saw this morning in our full year guidance release. You will also see that free cash flow will continue to grow as well as we deliver another year of record investment in our customers and our networks. In fact, in 2023, we have allocated an incremental $700 million of our CapEx envelope towards ensuring we continue to have the best wireless and wireline networks. As I reflect on the year, I am proud of our entire team for their relentless focus, disciplined execution, and firm commitment to our customers and shareholders. While there is clearly more work to do, we have reestablished momentum. Before I turn it over to Glenn, let me provide a brief update on Shaw. As you heard last week, the Federal Court of Appeal reaffirmed the decision of the Competition Tribunal. Two federal courts have now unanimously and decisively ruled in favor of these pro-competitive transactions, namely the sale of freedom to Quebecor and the sale of Shaw to Rogers. To quote the tribunal decision, there will continue to be four strong wireless competitors in Alberta and British Columbia. And the decision goes further, concluding that Quebecor will be a more disruptive wireless carrier and Rogers will inject a new and substantial source of competition. Given the matter is before the federal government for final approval, we will not provide any further comment at this time. Let me now turn the call over to Glenn. Thank you, Tony, and good morning, everyone. Thank you for joining us this morning. I know it's a busy morning. Rogers industry leading fourth quarter and full year results reflect the company's commitment to better execution combined with continued investment in our networks. In wireless, fourth quarter service revenue was up a very healthy 7%. This reflected higher roaming revenue as global travel, travel continued to recover, as well as a postpaid phone subscriber base which has consistently led on market share and growth throughout 2022. The wireless market in Canada is healthy and competitive, and our better execution is allowing us to grow share once again. Our loading was very strong as we added 193,000 postpaid net additions, reflecting a 37% increase from one year ago. Loading was particularly robust during the Black Friday and Boxing Week promotional periods, and we achieved record Black Friday loading with strength continuing through to the end of the quarter. As we have seen all year, our results have been driven by better execution, growth in our unlimited plans, increases in immigration, and the continuation of customers embracing the diversified value plans Rogers provides across Canada. Through the very active Q4 promotional period, postpaid mobile phone churn was also higher, again reflecting a very competitive Canadian wireless industry, with consumers very aware of the peak promotional periods 
and the available pricing and value alternatives. As a result of this increased activity, churn for the fourth quarter came in at 1.24% compared to 1.06% one year ago. ARPU for the quarter was 58.69, up 1% benefiting from consumers continuing to travel. We exited Q4 with roaming revenues at 140% of pre-pandemic levels and were just over 84% of pre-pandemic roaming traffic volume. Wireless adjusted EBITDA was up a solid 8%, reflecting excellent flow through from our service revenue growth with adjusted EBITDA service margins coming in at over 63%. Moving to our cable business, total revenue was stable and unchanged from one year ago, while adjusted EBITDA was up 1%, reflecting tighter cost performance. Cable adjusted EBITDA margin was 51%, which is up 60 basis points from a year ago. As Tony has noted, the fourth quarter continued to be a very aggressive and promotionally intense period in the wireline market, led by our national peer. We were largely measured and balanced in our competitive response, matching competitive offers where appropriate, while seeking to maintain underlying profitability wherever possible versus driving loading. Gross ads remain strong while customer churn remains elevated, reflecting that promotional activity. The market is competitive. On a product basis, we delivered 7,000 retail internet net customer additions in the fourth quarter, down from one year ago, again reflecting the highly promotional environment. Additionally, we continue to make significant investments in our cable network, spending $235 million in cable network infrastructure alone in Q4. In our media business, our results continue to reflect the quality of our sports and media assets, with strong top line and bottom line results in Q4. Revenue was up 17% driven by better content rates, a revenue distribution benefit from Major League Baseball, and higher advertising revenue in the quarter. This drove strong profitability with adjusted EBITDA of $57 million, an $83 million turnaround from the $26 million loss in the same quarter last year, which as you'll recall was affected by COVID on live sports. At a consolidated level, Q4 service revenue grew by 6% and adjusted EBITDA grew by 10%. Capital expenditures were $776 million and free cash flow excluding Shaw financing costs were $644 million. I should add, our deposit interest income is roughly covering our 4.2% weighted average coupon on our $13 billion cash held on reserve for the Shaw bond financing. We achieved our 2022 guidance range despite the $150 million credits paid to customers in the third quarter. On a consolidated basis for the full year, total service revenue grew over 6% and adjusted EBITDA increased by almost 9%. Capital expenditures came in at approximately $3.1 billion and free cash flow for the year, excluding Shaw financing, was $2.0 billion, all meeting guidance. This performance is a clear demonstration that we are growing top line and bottom line and reinvesting these profits aggressively and increasingly back into our networks for Canadians. Importantly, these results also show we are in a strong position operationally and financially as we prepare to integrate with Shaw. Succinctly, we are ready for when we receive the final regulatory approval. Turning to the balance sheet, at December 31, we had $4.9 billion of available liquidity, including $460 million of cash on hand and cash equivalents, and a combined $4.4 billion available under our revolving bank credit facilities. We also held $12.8 billion in restricted cash and cash equivalents that will be used to partially fund the cash consideration of the Shaw transaction when that closes. 
Our weighted average cost of all borrowings was 4.5% as at December 31, 2022. And our weighted average term to maturity was 11.8 years. Our debt leverage ratio at quarter end, excluding the Shaw financing, was 3.1 times compared to 3.4 times at December 31, 2021. As previously discussed, until we close the Shaw transaction, we use adjusted net debt, which excludes the Shaw financing and related cash held in reserve to analyze our debt and calculate leverage. The Shaw related senior notes, derivatives and restricted cash and cash equivalents associated with the transaction financing have been issued for the specific purpose of funding the acquisition, which of course is not yet closed. In terms of our outlook for the coming year, we continue to see strong momentum in our business, and we have provided a robust outlook for 2023. Our 2023 outlook includes, includes strong top line, bottom line, and free cash flow growth, along with continued emphasis on investing in our networks, focused in particular on network reliability and customer service. 2022 has been a year of remarkable turnaround, which will continue into 2023. We are executing well, and our outlook reflects this. We anticipate total service revenue growth in the range of 4 to 7 percent, and adjusted EBITDA growth in the range of 5 to 8 percent. These growth metrics continue to build on the industry-leading organic growth we delivered in 2022. We are also continuing with our commitment to invest in our networks in 2023. Our anticipated 2023 capital expenditures excluding Shaw integration costs will be in the $3.1 billion to $3.3 billion range. We anticipate free cash flow excluding Shaw integration will grow in 2023, ranging from $2.0 billion to $2.2 billion. As we head into 2023, we are monitoring the economic environment for signs of economic pressures, but we believe our execution is sound and we are managing effectively through the overall economic and business climate. Once we receive approval for the Shaw transaction, we will provide an update to our guidance, which will reflect the combination of these two strong and healthy organizations, but in the meantime, you can see that our underlying business is performing well and that we have not nor will become distracted. In summary, we are very pleased with our results in Q4 and for 2022. These results reflect the Rogers team's ability to make the necessary changes in the business and deliver better execution. And our teams did both of these very well without distraction. 2022 was not perfect, and we know we have more work to do, but we have the right team in place and have established a much improved cadence for delivering more consistent and leading results. Thank you for your interest and attention this morning, and with that, Ariel, can you please commence with the Q&A? Certainly. We will now begin the question and answer session. To join the question queue, you may press star, then one on your telephone keypad you'll hear a tone acknowledging your request. If you are using a speakerphone, please pick up your handset before pressing any keys. To withdraw your question, please press star, then two. We will pause for a moment as callers join the queue. Our first question comes from Vince Valentini of TD Securities. Please go ahead. Yeah, thanks very much. Um, the guidance you've given uh, looks impressive, by the way, and, and good fourth quarter, I should add. Um, can you clarify what, you've, what you're doing with your wireless ARPU assumptions in there? There seems to be a lot of moving pieces with roaming and, and potentially new, new competition. Um, would you be assuming positive wireless ARPU growth within the service revenue and EBITDA uh, guidance you provided? You, you will see continued though slowing growth in ARPU coming from roaming. You will see continued emphasis on um, our customers upgrading to unlimited plans and premium plans, and so that will have a positive impact on ARPU, Vince. Uh, so yes, you'll see 
that revenue growth um, will also be flowing through ARPU. Cool. And just to clarify, Glenn, uh, the, um, the new guidance, assuming you get the deal done, it, it, will we have to sort of wait until your next scheduled call in April with Q1 results, or are you planning some sort of interim investor uh, event to, uh, to showcase what the, the pro forma looks like? I think, Vince, in, in fairness, let me, let me not presume timing of when that will come and, and, and get ahead of our skis. We, uh, we will be ready when we get clearance, um, but, but let me not guess when that will come relative to our next, uh, uh, next earnings release or prior. Um, I don't want to be presumptuous, and I don't want to uh, speak on behalf of others that uh, the file's on their desk. Fair enough. Thank you. Our next question comes from Mar Yagi of Scotiabank. Please go ahead. Uh, thank you for taking my questions. Uh, good morning and uh, congratulations on the good results, uh, especially for the guidance, which is, uh, you know, in within the current environment is, is, is impressive. But I, I, I did want to ask you a question related to the overall wireless market. We're starting to see deceleration of uh, wireless service uh, revenues and subscriber loading in the U.S. And some of that is coming from, uh, you know, reduction in enterprise and uh, the business segment. Um, now, Canada is, is a different beast for sure. Uh, we're seeing a lot of immigration. But can you talk a little bit about your expectation for wireless in 23? Uh, and are you seeing any deceleration of your business segment, which could, you know, um, put some uh, cap on uh, how much further growth we can see in uh, subscriber loading. Thanks for the question, Mayor. As you uh, stated um, in your comments, Canada is slightly different than the U.S. macro environment owing to a couple of things that have helped us in, on the wireless side from a market perspective in 22 which we expect to continue into 23. And we've talked about them before, but notably uh, the level and pacing of immigration uh, continues to be strong. When we look at foreign students and temporary workers, that pacing continues to be strong as well. And importantly, the penetration levels in Canada continue to have headroom. And so as we head into 23, we're not foreseeing uh, downward pressure on those and with respect to the business what we have seen is proportionately the business segment in a particular small business has continued to grow in line with the consumer and those trends that I, I just talked about and so as we look to 23 we continue to see a fairly healthy backdrop you know if we look at the overall wireless uh, market total number of subscribers uh, for the market seems to have grown in 22 by just over 5% and uh, one of the healthiest growth rates we've seen uh, in a long time. And so our expectation is that we'll continue to see healthy growth um, in 23. may not be as high as 22 because there is a bit of the post-pandemic uh, catch-up, we believe, that happened earlier in the year. Um, but as we uh, look for the rest of the year, uh, we continue to see uh, uh, opportunity uh, for that that growth. Thank you. And, and, and just a sorry, follow, sorry, follow Mayor, up. on the yeah, go ahead, on the go guidance ahead. that you see, it reflects that population growth. You asked specifically about uh, about the business market. As you know, I think in the business market we have an opportunity to continue to increase our um, our share in that market. But I think if you look at our service revenue guidance of 4 to 7 percent, it's reflective of, of those general trends of population growth. So we're not, we're not out of line. Sorry okay. to cut you off. No, no, no. Thank you. Thank you for that uh, uh, increased uh, uh, information. But uh, I wanted to ask you, in terms of the operational performance, and, and Tony, you know, since you came in, uh, you implemented changes. Uh, we're, we're seeing, uh, you know, the, the benefit on, on the bottom line. Uh, can you talk a little bit, you know, what's the, what's the next step in your uh, overall view of, you know, how to imp 
obviously keep improving operations even further from here. Um, what should we be looking for in terms of uh, changes that we could see at Rogers uh, beyond what's happening with the Shah dossier? It's a good question, Mayor. And um, you know what you saw this year, uh, when I say this year in 2022, was a rebalancing back to the fundamentals of our business, which has been. Uh, quite frankly, let's ensure we have the best network and ramp up investment in our wireless and wireline network combined with improvements in the customer experience. And as we head into 23 um, and we look at the industry, what you'll continue to see is improvements in our network that are tangibly visible to our consumers and business customers. Uh, that's important to us. And secondarily, when we think about customer service, we think about the customer experience. Uh, and as an industry, as technology continues to evolve, we see the opportunity to continue to make things simpler for our customers and continue on the agenda of resiliency and redundancy of our network. And so they need connections they can trust that are always on. And those are the themes that you'll continue to hear us focus on. And we believe that's going to be the fundamental catalyst to continue to have leading market share um, as we head into 23 that will convert to the financials that you see. It's as simple as that in our mind, Bear. Thank you. Great. Thanks, Mayor. Next question, Ariel. Our next question comes from Drew McReynolds of RBC. Please go ahead. Yeah, thanks very much. Uh, good morning. Um, just expanding on the, the previous question, uh, maybe starting with you, Tony, um, specifically on the cable side, I think everyone's kind of well aware of um, the strategy there uh, and, and, and getting that segment back on, on its feet post-outage, uh, but also in anticipation of a, a broader transaction. It, it could be in a transition. Just wondering, you know, what your expectations are on the cable side for Rogers standalone um, you know, as we at least start the beginning of the year here. Um, and then secondly, for you, Glenn, uh, just an update on, on my end on the balance sheet, um, assuming the deal closes. Obviously, there's been, with the passage of time, uh, some delivering, uh, evolving market conditions, et cetera. Just would love to hear um, how you're seeing delivering post-deal close uh, over the next two to three years just relative to uh, – you know, what you've, you've previously indicated, if there's any change there. Thank you. Thanks for the question, Drew. Um, in terms of uh, the cable side of the business, uh, think about it in, in two, two points. Uh, one is the backdrop um, will accelerate growth. We saw very good growth in the market size and wireless, and it's, there's a bit of a lag as that translates to new home construction and homes passed in our cable business. So we see that fueling a growth in homes passed. That will be combined with additional investments we'll put into homes passed. So we see the opportunity and high likelihood for the size of the market for us to continue to grow. And as we retool some of the fundamentals in that business, um, our expectation is you will see um, largely in the back half of 23, um, but starting to see early signs uh, in Q1 and more so in Q2, improvements in subscriber market share. You see in the fundamentals uh, retooling of the business in terms of um, bringing in simplicity in our operations. We've actually invested more in customer experience uh, than we have in any previous year, yet our overall cost structure has come down uh, for cable. And that's really a reflection of that um, transformation to the fundamentals in that business. We've also at the same time, and we've talked about this on previous calls, are re-indexing from our flanker FIDO Internet back to the Rogers main brand. It's a much better customer experience in terms of uh, a better modem, um, and a whole bunch of things related to that. Um, and you see that when we look at the churn in the Flanker product versus our main brand. Rogers Internet has substantially 
uh, by a wide margin lower churn than FIDO Internet. So what you see us is trying to move to um, the more value add brand for us of Rogers, and we've been making that change. In the short term, our main competitor has launched, I would describe aggressive uh, competitive promotional pricing, especially in the higher tiers of one gig uh, and above, uh, which is fine, we'll compete with that. But as Glenn said in his opening remarks, our response to that will be very measured at the right time in terms of uh, competing uh, on that basis. Uh, but right now, there were a few things we wanted to focus on in, in the fundamentals um, in that business. And so that's what you're seeing play out and how we think about our outlook for this year. And then, Drew, in terms of, of the Shaw transaction and our, our balance sheet, um, when we receive the regulatory approval and close on, on Shaw, I'll start with we have all of the permanent funding in place to close. We have uh, $13 billion in um, cash held in reserve from the proceeds from our $13 billion in bond issues from last March 2022. Um, that, those bonds, as you, you'll all recall, uh, are in place and extended out through to uh, being available through to year end 23, so we have plenty of runway there. We also have $6 billion in committed bank term loans. Uh, with terms ranging from three to five years, split evenly across three, four, and five years. Um, so that takes our, our cash funding up to $19 billion available. Um, and then there is uh, a portion of the purchase price, of course, that's done in, uh, in shares for the, uh, the Shaw family. Uh, and then finally, there will be proceeds that come in uh, from the transaction into Shaw Communications before we close from Shaw's sale of freedom to Quebec All. And so um, all of that netted together, we have all of the funding in place to close the transaction and meet all of our liquidity needs through the year without touching the $4.9 billion of liquidity I mentioned we had on hand at year end. Um, so the balance sheet is strong in terms of, of corporate funding. Um, We'll meet all of our maturities and uh, and and um, uh, Rogers specific commitments as well as being able to close on Shaw without needing to come back to the capital markets. Um, in terms of where we will be on leverage when we close, we'll be right around uh, five times, maybe a you know a, a tick over five times when we close. Um, depending upon timing. We've taken advantage of the time that we've had to, uh, um, uh, to you know, have, have strong organic growth within the Roger standalone business. We have had some uh, expenses come in along the way, which we now have to cover on our balance sheet, not the least of which was the cost of extending those, uh, those bonds because we did not close in 22, even with those added expenses coming in. Um, we will still be uh, closing right around five times, low five times when we close on the transaction, I anticipate. And then going forward, we haven't given a forecast as to uh, you know, schedule around delevering, but uh, uh, if you look at, uh, at where our EBITDA rolls up with Shaw's EBITDA, and then you, uh, you look at where our path is on synergies, I think you'll, you'll see through earnings growth alone, we, uh, we generate some significant delevering on an annual basis. I don't know, if you're looking for a rough rule of thumb, think of it in the range of probably 0.4 to 0.6 times, depending upon the year, depending upon how much of the year we have um, you know, left in 23 once we close. Um, but if you were to try and model it along those lines, Drew, I think you'd probably be in the ballpark. Um, and then free cash flow in the, uh, in the outer years, maybe not in the first 12 months, but we will have available free cash flow to nominally pay down debt as well. That's about as fulsome as I want to get right now, but that will give you an idea how to model it. That's great. Very, very thorough answers. Thank you both. Thank you, Drew. Uh, next question, Ariel. Our next question comes from Sebastiano Petty of J.P. Morgan. Please go ahead. 
Hi, good morning. Thanks for taking the question. Just just sticking with the um, cable network investment and competition theme, uh, you did mention in your prepared remarks that the fourth quarter was aggressive and in promotional intensity uh, from your national peer, but at the same time, I, I think, Tony, you mentioned that you expect perhaps market share trends to improve in 1Q and 2Q. So on a near-term basis, if you can maybe unpack um, some of the drivers there that you expect um, to, you know, within the first and second quarter to, to lead to the better subscriber market share, that would be great. And then maybe a longer-term question. Um, in, you know, in the U.S., you're seeing the, you know, your larger peers, Charter, Comcast, talk about DOCSIS 4.0 upgrade path. Obviously, you are largely going to follow the Comcast path, but they've outlined a goal to get the DOCSIS 4.0 by 2025, pretty much ubiquitously across their footprint. Um, what does that mean for Rogers? How, you know, while market share trends may improve over the next couple of quarters here relative to Bell, they are continuing on their fiber path, assuming the transactions with Shaw closes here shortly. Obviously, TELUS is pretty formidable in terms of fiber overlap as well. Just maybe give us a view on how Rogers is thinking about the long-term HFC DOCSIS 4.0 upgrade path and maintaining uh, you know, competitiveness relative to your fiber peers. Thank you. Thanks for the question, Sebastiano. Um, two parts to your question. The first is, you know, as we look to 23, and I just want to clarify as we talk about market share improvements, um, I just want to reiterate and level set expectations that it will be a progressive uh, ramp in 23, um, a little bit in the first quarter, ramping to the second quarter, and then into the back half. Um, and so I just want to uh, um, just make sure uh, we're not getting too far ahead of ourselves. In terms of the fundamentals that get us there, um, we're very focused on the customer experience and are they getting reliable internet at speeds that they want? We're less focused on a price battle. What we do know is you can sign on a customer at a very low ARPU, but in the end, if they're getting experience they're not happy with, then that is the primary reason for change. We continually look at uh, the market, reasons for customers coming on board, reasons for customers leaving, and across the industry, and that's true of both Canada and U.S., uh, while price is always important, a more important factor is the Internet reliability. And that's because we just, uh, even in the consumer space with a lot of work from home, it's become so critical. And so those fundamentals around customer experience is what we believe will, in the long term, continue to drive the right gross ad uh, and the right churn fundamentals. Uh, so that's point one. Um, the second point relates to DOCSIS 4. Let me be clear, we do not have a competitive disadvantage in our Internet business. In fact, we see it as a competitive advantage. In our footprint, we've been deploying fiber all the way to the home, all the way to the business premise uh, for over a decade. And so we have robust, complete fiber to the prem um, throughout our footprint and where it isn't, and we still have coax in the last mile, we're in the fortunate position that coax in the last mile continues to deliver speeds that are well beyond customer demand at this stage. We're offering uh, at least one to one and a half gigs across our entire footprint. 99% of our footprint is capable of those speeds, and in many areas, that's now two and a half gigs and growing rapidly. The migration to DOCSIS 4 will only enhance the top end of those speeds. And we expect that to come uh, as a fast follow, if not in line with where you see our U.S. peers going on DOCSIS 4. The biggest limiting factor, and you've heard that from, from them, I suspect, are the chipsets um, that uh, support the DOCSIS 4. Uh, but we're extremely comfortable that as we look to 24 and 25 deployment for DOCSIS 4, uh, that will still be well ahead of where the market demand is. So we have plenty of capacity, plenty of headroom um, to meet uh, the customer expectations. 
um, as we move to DOCSIS 4. But again, that's for that portion of our network um, where the cost effectiveness of coax in the last mile continues to be very compelling. Great, thank you. Thanks, Sebastiano. Next question, Ariel. Our next question comes from Dave Barden of Bank of America, Merrill Lynch. Please go ahead. Hey, guys. Thanks so much for taking the question. Um, so I guess my, I want to talk a little bit about the merger um, and congrats on getting this far in the process and, and your success there. Um, the first question would be, given that it's been – probably a year longer than we thought, and given what we've watched happen, you know, with at least down here in, you know, Charter and LT, um, and their, you know, response to fiber overbuild, um, are, are the synergies of this merger that you articulated two years ago at a billion dollars still real? Um, and, and how do you think about the CapEx requirements of maybe absorbing Shaw in the future, that'd be one. And then the second one would be, not to put you in a tough spot, but really to put you in a tough spot, which is, you know, you're making the argument that Kevacor and whatever you've done in your agreements with them is going to make them a more effective competitor in – the Canadian wireless market, which sounds like a terrible thing if you're an equity investor in Rogers. Can you square that for me and, and the market? Like, why, why is the net of these two things that you've given up to create a better competitor in Kenicor less than the benefit that I'm going to get from being an investor in the benefits of the Shaw Cable merger synergy? Um, I just I just need a, a refresher on how this all makes me excited about the Rogers transaction. Dave, I'll start, and uh, Glenn will uh, fill in on um, on some additional points. But as we look to, and we've continually assessed uh, throughout how our investment thesis on the Shaw transaction uh, compares to what we thought, and I think there's two things. Um, that I would describe at a macro level. Firstly, on the cost synergies, the additional time has allowed us to, as I mentioned earlier, make progress on retooling our own shop. And so we will be entering uh, that transaction from a position of greater clarity on our cost structure and our cost roadmap. And so at a very macro level, we have heightened confidence um, on the synergy benefits. The second piece, and we haven't talked about it um, much, uh, if at all, are the revenue synergies on this. From the time we did the deal, we look at the Canadian population in particular, where um, Shaw has its primary cable markets, and that growth is more than we had expected uh, when we looked at it two years ago, owing to those factors that are driving our own cable market growth that I uh, mentioned earlier. A number of other factors as well, but if we step back and look at those two primary um, factors, uh, the investment thesis not only continues to hold, but in our view, uh, continues to improve with the passing of time. The second part of your question relates to having a fourth wireless competitor. We have uh, thrived in a competitive landscape uh, in the past including in 2022. We've entered into transactions that will allow the buyer of freedom to enhance their competitive ability, and it's over to us, and we're confident we have what we need to be able to compete in a four-player market just as we've done in the past. And it's all going to be about relative share, and in a four-player market, um, there are a number of dynamics, and um, so when you talk about the impact, um, it isn't necessarily uh, anything that a fourth player picks up is at the expense of Rogers. 
there are dynamics in market share, and we're comfortable, as I said, that we have what we need uh, to be able to compete for share uh, in that space. And then, and then, Dave, maybe if I could just add in a little bit more on, you asked on synergies and capital expenditures. Um, as Tony's mentioned, we've had more time to look at the synergies. We remain committed to that. So Tony's touched on that. The capital expenditure piece, um, we've the 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 plan, the model, the, the forecast hasn't changed from from our initial evaluation of the transaction. I think fundamentally, if you look at Shaw Communications and how it operated its wireline and its wireless business over the last few years, a significant portion of its capital spend has gone into the wireless side of that balance sheet and investing in their their the build out of their wireless infrastructure. We have a strong national wireless network that we already have well in hand in terms of investing. Our acquisition of, of Shaw is an acquisition of the wireline side of their business. We will take Shaw Communications annual capital spend and devote it to wireline assets in the West succinctly. And so if you if you work on that premise, you can, you know, you can I think ladder up to what that that uh, that business plan looks like and how it forecasts out. But um, that's in a nutshell, that's how we prepare for taking in Shaw and the capital spend related to Shaw. It will be focused on wireline investing in the West um, to go along with what we're already doing in our our core business today. Um, and I think I think Tony's answered the rest of it. All right. Yep. Yeah, thank you, Bob. Appreciate it. Thanks, Thanks. Dave. Thanks, David. Uh, next question, Ariel. The next question is from Tim Casey with BMO Capital Markets. Please go ahead. Yeah, thanks. A few for me. Um, one, just a clarification, Glenn, just on that, that CapEx comment, are, are you implying that you'll spend the billion dollars a year in Western Canada or the seven, notionally the 700 that they've, they've spent on wireline? I'm, I'm not going to get into, into uh, you know, the, the close specifics yet, Tim. Um, you know, we're we're in 2023. I've given our our guidance for 23 standalone. We'll see when we close the transaction before I start. You know, telling yep. you what numbers we're going to spend on on Shaw in year. But um, you know, we will invest um, in the wireline networks to to invest in customer service across our entire footprint. Once we take in Shaw, that entire footprint will, will go from coast to coast, will invest as needed, and that'll be an investment program that's done over years, not over over months. So, um, Understood. Okay. Got it. Uh, okay, a couple of questions for Tony and one for you, Glenn. Just, Tony, could you talk a little bit about the wireless loading dynamics in the quarter and, and the outlook? I mean, you had a very successful loading quarter, but you know, ARPU and churn did um, did uh, were affected. Uh, I mean, is were you more active on the flanker brands, perhaps in anticipation of a freedom at Quebec, or can you just talk about the competitive dynamics within the brands in the quarter? Um, and then, I'm just curious uh, if you could comment on some of the media signaling coming out of. Um, uh, chairperson Etrides at the CRTC and, you know, focused on pricing again. Uh, just wondering if you've had any dialogue or any comments. You know, we, many of us have heard this kind of signaling before, just would be interested in your perspective. And lastly, uh, Glenn, just um, a clarification on the media number. It looks like there's a, a one-time BAM contribution in the fourth quarter. It, it, could you confirm that and perhaps quantify it? Thank you. Thanks, Tim, for the questions. A um, couple of things is uh, just to give you some context on the fourth quarter, quite a bit of a competitive intensity in terms of promotional activities, uh, not just on the price plans, but uh, to some extent on the handsets as well. Um, so what you saw play out, and we were largely more reactive in terms of um, the flanker. In fact, when you look at um, over the course, much like on uh, home internet, We've been re-indexing back to our premium brand 
And if you look at the rate of growth in the fourth quarter of Rogers vis-a-vis -vis FIDO, um, what you see is a significantly um, faster rate of growth on Rogers. Um, and so we're pleased with that on balance. So notwithstanding that competitive intensity, uh, we continue to make good traction on re-indexing back to uh, our premium brand and something we've been on uh, throughout 2022 and will continue to do in uh, in 23. Um, but no doubt uh, some of the value out there, and it's just a reflection of the market, um, there was good value for uh, consumers uh, in the fourth quarter. And uh, the overall impact on service revenue was uh, – is offset by share gains, uh, which is important in, in a market where the rate of growth is accelerating. And so we're always trying to balance off uh, both of those. Um, and I think we, we are striking the right balance uh, between uh, market share gains and, uh, and ARPU uh, growth as well. And so that's what really reflected the heightened churn uh, that you saw in Q4 um, uh, for us and the industry. In terms of um, your, your second question um, and on pricing, well, uh, there's not a lot I could say uh, with respect to um, the new CRTC chair. Uh, we look forward to working uh, constructively and proactively um, at the right time uh, with the mandate of, uh, of the CRTC as we would with any other uh, regulatory body. But what I will say is, um, we feel good about the market dynamics and the value add that the industry and Rogers is bringing to customers. It's uh, I continue to highlight against the backdrop of increasing inflation in a number of parts of the uh, sector and consumer goods. Our industry and Rogers continues to reduce pricing. If you're to look at it over the last several years and in particular over 2022, uh, one of the few, if not the only, uh, sector that actually has price declines uh, in the marketplace. And, and that's owing to the, uh, the competitive intensity that's out there. And frankly, as I've said in, in other forums, uh, our intent to continue to figure out ways to bring more value add to, uh, to, to customers. And then, Tim, just quickly on your question around the MLB proceeds, I, uh, it's not my transaction to, uh, to release the details on. Uh, and so I can't, I can't give you a specific amount. Um, it does relate to MLB having sold a minority interest um, in uh, the remaining minority interest it held in, uh, in one of its properties and then the distribution to each of the teams. Um, and so that was our, you know, we, we recorded our share of it in the quarter. Thank you both. Thanks, Tim. Thank you, Tim. Tim next question, Ariel. Our next question comes from Simon Flannery of Morgan Stanley. Please go ahead. Great. Thank you very much. Good morning. Uh, you talked a little bit about revenue synergies, and one of the things we're seeing uh, in the U.S. is the rise of the uh, double play, the Internet plus wireless bundle, and uh, the, the triple play bundle kind of declining over time. Perhaps you could just give us a little bit of a sense of how you see that in Ontario, what, what sort of uh, – uh, performance you see having being able to offer that combination to your customers, what percentages of, of your cable base does have your wireless product, and, and how do you see the opportunity to bring that playbook uh, to Western Canada? Thanks. Thanks for the question, Simon. I'll start, um, and, and Glenn will pick up. But uh, at a very macro level, um, we've, we've been watching that trend uh, closely uh, in the U.S. I'd say in Canada, we've... Uh, because we've had, uh, I would say, more experience at it, having been a cable and wireless operator um, in significant parts of, uh, of the country uh, for a long period of time. In terms of the bundling, it's largely been a price dynamic in terms of uh, enticing the customer to it. When you look at the actual buy dynamic, uh, in many ways the channel distribution is different in how the customer buys. Um, and a number of other factors in terms of um, the decision-making criteria um, and how they think about them. And so other than promotional incentives to bundle them, um, I would say the fundamentals of the business seem to be, um, continue to be um, somewhat separate. And so we'll continue to capitalize on that coming together uh, at the right time 
Um, but price alone isn't uh, the answer long term, and it really gets back to uh, the the comments I gave earlier with respect to long term cable uh, churn rates. Um, so we continue to watch that trend, and uh, certainly it, it's an opportunity uh, for us in terms of bundling. We don't disclose the specifics of uh, within our footprint what that um, uh, looks like in terms of bundled offering for competitive reasons. Um, but I would say it uh, is growing, uh, but perhaps not as much as you might think. And maybe the only the only thing I would add to that, Simon, is our uh, uh, Ignite uh, offering is, uh, is particularly attractive as people's viewing habits turn towards streaming to uh, to help still uh, provide a, a base upon which to sell um, our video service product. It is a very strong offering that allows people to access streaming as well as you know the traditional channel lineups very conveniently. So that does help. Uh, um, help as well. Great. And was there anything to call out on the video um, numbers in the quarter? I think I think it. You know, we've we've touched on on what I think the priorities were. It was a it is a very competitive market. It remains competitive going into 23. Um, and uh, you know, I don't think there's really anything more to call out than that. Thank you. Thank you, Sam. Uh, next question, Ariel. Our next question comes from Stephanie Price of CIBC. Please go ahead. Morning. On 5G, can you talk a little bit more about the 5G rollout and the 5G mid-band coverage targets you have and, and what you've seen in terms of an uptick in customers moving to higher tier plans once you've deployed it? Um, and, and finally, how you think about network costs as you operate both 4G and, and 5G networks uh, in the near term? Thanks for the question, Stephanie. Um, in terms of 5G rollout, um, you know, as you saw on previous calls, we were very quick out of the gate uh, very early in the year to uh, deploy um, the uh, mid-band spectrums, as you referenced, uh, very quickly. We're, as of today, we're sitting at uh, approaching 85%. We're at about 83% today in terms of 5G coverage. Um, and so we continue a very aggressive ramp. Um, and you can expect that as we head um, towards the end of the year, that will approach 90%. Um, so we continue to deploy that uh, spectrum uh, very quickly. Um, and. Uh, and in many markets, you'll um, you know you'll see the banner 5G plus, much like you do in the U.S. And you know that will continue to be um, uh, at a very uh, rapid pace as well. Um, so that's all all proceeding well. I think in terms of the of the network costs, Stephanie, think of it in the context of the the higher band spectrum carries more data. Um, the 5G service users consume more data. On a, on a per gig basis, you need the mid and higher bands, um, and we'll need those you know, as we move into the years to come to carry the data. But it's, re it's a, the capital investment in that spectrum and getting it into our towers that you know, think of that as being the network costs associated with 5G. They're fixed costs largely. They're, they're, they're the capital spend that we put into spectrum, into infrastructure. Um, and uh, those are the fixed costs that you don't see in the margins. You see them below the EBITDA line in terms of our capital spend. Um, once we get them out there, we deploy them, and, uh, and we can run services out to our customers. Great. Thank you very much. Next question, Ariel. Our next question comes from Jerome DeBruyne of Desjardins. Please go ahead. Hey, good morning. Thanks for uh, for taking my questions. Uh, two for me. The first one is on cable. Uh, I would like to get a, an update on the percentage of your uh, cable network that overlaps with uh, fiber to the premises. And then second question on on wireless. Uh, great full state uh, ads again. Uh, would you agree that now a larger proportion of uh, of wireless subscriber growth? Comes from from a bit of a lower end of the market, then uh, if yes, uh, what does that mean uh, in terms of the of the strategy to adopt to uh, to go to market? Thank you. Thanks for the question, Jerome. I'll start with the second part. 
um, and then Colin will come back to uh, the cable question. In terms of uh, the wireless, as you think about new, uh, new to Canada as well as the student migration, certainly that segment would index first to uh, the flanker brands, uh, and we're certainly seeing that. And as um, so, I would say in the near term, there's a slight indexation to that, uh, but at the same time. What we're finding is uh, a very good and healthy migration to the Rogers brand, especially as a result of, as we've talked about, our focused efforts on uh, on that migration within our base. Um, and so um, I would say it continues to be balanced, um, much like it always has been. And so I wouldn't overstate that the, the market is moving to, uh, in a big way, to the flanker. As I said, I, I think it's slight, uh, but there's more uh, than enough offsetting uh, in the base and the rest of the market to get the right uh, mix to uh, the premium brand. And Jerome, in terms of, of the percentage of our, our network that, that we have fiber to the prem, um, without, without seeking to frustrate you with my answer, we, we're opportunistic with it. Um, Atlantic Canada is is an overbuild or a rebuild of our of our network facilities, because Atlantic Canada is primarily aerial over the air um, uh, transmission, and poles are simply easier to run fiber um, than than burying and replacing plant that way. On a cost per home pass basis, we can be opportunistic and run fiber through Atlantic Canada. New new construction build when the trenches are open, we're putting in fiber to the prem. We're opportunistic with it, but don't think of it in the context of, you know, they've done X percent and still have 100 minus X percent to go. Um, our hybrid fiber coax has a long, long tenure still to run. DOCSIS 4 will be, um, you know, entirely competitive with, with whatever we can deliver over our fiber to the prem uh, plant as well. They'll be comparable. And we will be competitive with uh, with our peers, where they have fiber to the prem over our hybrid doxis, uh, or sorry, hybrid uh, fiber coax plant. So, um, think of it in that regard. Okay, thank you. Thanks, Jerome. Next question, Ariel. Our next question comes from Aravinda Galatarige of Canaccord Genuity. Please go ahead. Morning. Thanks for taking my question. Um, two for me. Uh, one, um, just to go back to wireless, Chen. Um, obviously, you know, we're seeing an uptick, which is obviously natural considering sort of the return of foot traffic and so forth. But uh, maybe, Tony, you can talk about your expectations over the medium to longer run. I mean, there's always been a case to suggest that there is uh, there can be structural uh, decline in churn, which would obviously help margins and, uh, you know, assist the, the, the broader model. Uh, for, for all the reasons that have been cited from, you know, family plans to, to sort of the life cycle of the device. I wanted to get your thoughts on how you see that, you know, that 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 thesis uh, in light of sort of what we're seeing right now where most of the companies are coming in with, with higher uh, wireless churn. And then um, uh, perhaps with Glenn uh, on the free cash flow guide, um, you know, I did notice that cash taxes were materially lower in 2022. I wanted to get a sense of... Uh, is there any color you can provide on what uh, you're building in for 23 there with respect to cash taxes? Thank you. Arvinda, on the uh, first part uh, with respect to you know, our thoughts on wireless churn uh, and the implication of it, uh, certainly, you know, as you've said, the industry has traditionally thought of lower churn um, as a better enabler because um, you save on the cost of acquisition. I think what we found was um, – you know, in particular when you look at the fourth quarter and the competitive intensity there, um, I would say the general principle um, is still true. L lower churn is always better, and we're always focused on making sure we try to keep uh, as many customers, and, and losing one is always too many. So that, that fundamental doesn't change, but at the same time, you know, the cost of acquisition, if you looked at the industry um, overall, over the last three to four years has been coming down. And so notwithstanding the, the, the slightly heightened churn that you see in the fourth quarter, you, know, you continue to look at our margins sitting at a, 
um, uh, strong performance there, and it's actually up year on year despite uh, the increase in, in churn. And so when you look at the fundamentals of it, um, you know, I would say our thinking on this is sort of real time uh, matured so that we get the, the right balance. And, um, you know, ultimately it's net mobile phone market share that, that we stay focused on. Um, and the, the churn aspect is, you know, one piece of that formula on a secondary metric basis. Hope that helps. And then, uh, Arvind, on the uh, on the free cash flow and the and and the cash taxes, there's not there is not a material difference from year to year. Really, um, you'll see some difference going from 22 to 23 as a result of the quarterly timing of some cash taxes that were paid in 22, but it's not it it, it it's not a you know thematically material number from one year to the next. Great. Thank you. Uh, Ariel, we have time for two more questions. Certainly. Our next question comes from Batia Levy of UBS. Please go ahead. Great. Thank you. Um, can you provide an update on how we should think about this synergies or maybe merger integration costs after the deal? And um, a second question on what you're seeing in the business market and what could be the opportunity after you close the deal. Thank you. Good morning, Batia, and thanks for the question. Uh, I'll start with the second one, um, and Glenn will come back to the first question. In terms of the overall business market, uh, as you heard in my uh, opening uh, or on a previous question, the population growth um, and the contributors to overall market growth um, that I talked about is certainly helping the consumer side, and as you would expect, we see a very quick follow-on lag in the business market. So the size of the business market um, is improving as well, while at the same time our penetration rates in business, and in particular um, small business, uh, continues to improve. And so the growth that we're seeing is, uh, I would say, slightly more indexed to small business, um, and that continues to be uh, an area that uh, we're quite, quite pleased um, with our uh, our performance in that and continue to see more opportunity for height penetration there. And then, Batya, on the, uh, on the cost to achieve the synergies, I think as a, as a rough rule of thumb, if you think of it as you know, we're, we're uh, driving at a billion dollars a year of synergies, think of it as, as likely you know, a one times turn on that in terms of our cost to achieve. That will give you a rough rule of thumb to, uh, to work off of. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Uh, last question, Ariel. Our final question comes from David McFadgen of Cormark Securities. Please go ahead. <clears throat> yeah, thanks for uh, squeezing in. Um, so just looking at the guidance, obviously the guidance looks quite strong. I was just wondering if you can give us an update on the revenue, sorry, roaming revenue, uh, volume versus uh, revenue in the fourth quarter and then sort of what your outlook is for next year. <clears throat> and then the second question is, um, I know that you say that uh, your fees are comparable to, say, Bell's fiber offering, um, but how do you explain the fact that they keep putting up very strong internet net apps, particularly relative to you, and then when you add up all the other cable competitors and the footprint, it seems like they're taking a share there. Thanks. Thanks for the question, Dave. Um, uh, again, I'll uh, start with the second one, and um, um, Glenn will come back to the first one. Uh, as I said, on the uh, subscriber uh, share on the Internet side on, on cable, um, it's not lost on us in terms of um, uh, our performance on customer share. And so it's something we've looked at very closely, and as I said, um, our response will continue to be uh, very disciplined and measured. Um, and um, what you see there is not um, a capability uh, discrepancy, but all you're seeing play out is uh, pricing. And uh, as I said, I think we've got the right approach on this and we're playing the long game. And so um, I wouldn't confuse uh, short-term promotional pricing with the long-term health of 
that business and the fundamentals in that business. Um, you know, I continue to reiterate that capability speeds on home internet continue to far outpace uh, where customer demand is. Um, and so, you know, average speeds uh, would sit in the 300 uh, megs. And so when you compare that to um, top end speeds that are available in the marketplace, uh, we're well beyond that by a factor uh, approaching 10x. Um, so that's why I say network capability um, is not at all an issue. And in fact, as I said, uh, we think of our network as a competitive advantage when you look at internet and our TV product uh, combined um, across our footprint. And so, um, so that's what uh, you see playing out. Um, and in our view, it's as simple as that. And then, David, on uh, on roaming, um, succinctly, we're uh, we're running at about 85 percent of roaming volume relative to 2019 pre-COVID levels, and we're sitting at uh, we've ticked up to about 140 percent uh, revenue comparatively uh, against 2019 pre-COVID um, uh, revenue volumes or revenue. So. Um, you know, we've we've seen that tick up from Q2 and Q3. Travel remains uh, ongoing, um, and so you know we're we're through largely through that cycle of getting back to where we were. Maybe a little bit more room, um, but uh, on in terms of volume, but we're uh, we've we've ticked up a little bit. I would anticipate that roaming revenue to temper a little bit. You're not going to see that necessarily grow um, uh, you know, much more than, uh, than where we're sitting other than filling in the rest of that volume. Well, maybe I could just, just ask, uh, just to follow up on that, because I'm just wondering how you explain your roaming uh, metrics, like 85% of volume, 140% of revenue, when you look at how they announced today that uh, their volume's flat for pre-COVID and their revenue's 112%. So your revenue is up substantially more than theirs, but, and your volume is lower, which implies you have some spending more outside on roaming than they do. So how, how do you explain that? I'm just wanting to get your comments on that. So without getting inside their numbers, I can't, you know, I, I, I got to reserve my response to mine. I'm, I'm confident in where we are. These are rough rules of thumb. You know, the 85% from month to month, maybe it's five or ten different here and there. There might be a little bit of rounding. I think, I think generally you can see it in the airports. The airports are busy. Travel is back. Business travel is lighter than it had been previously. There's, consumer travel is probably a little bit heavier. Business travel a little bit lighter than where we were, you know, going through COVID. Um, if airports, you know, are, are able to get their flow sorted out, I think you'll see continued growth in travel. Um, we're coming up on March break. It'll be interesting to see what those volumes are. I think, uh, I think let me re just respond by saying the roaming growth is relatively mature relative to where we were two years ago, one year ago. And so, We've seen some sequential growth from Q2 and 3 into Q4. We've ticked up to 140 versus 130. Great. Um, you know, we, I think if we hold that, grow it a little bit as, as more business travel comes back, um, you know, there's still, uh, there's still room for a little bit of growth. Um, and, uh, you know, it'll be what it'll be. I'll pause there. Okay. All right. Thanks so much. Thanks, David. Uh, thanks, uh, everyone, for joining us today. And if there's any follow-up, please feel free to reach out to us. Thank you. Thank you all. This concludes today's conference call. You may disconnect your lines. Thank you for participating, and have a pleasant day.